know if I can start because I see that it's 10 and I'm not certain if this everyone returned from the break. So silent. <laughs> So I have like some kind of the clue for us. So if you want me to start, just read the slide. Yes. yes. <laughs> Excellent. This was the first exercise. Now it will be really, really difficult. I know that it's morning, but I hope you manage it. So now it's the difficult one. So no, just read. Come on, I can't hear you. Some energy. No. Ah, better, better. <coughs> You almost don't need me, but today we'll be talking about art of saying no. Uh, I'm Kasia Mrowca and be your host today. And what is all this stuff about? Basically, we'll discuss how to avoid growing scope and excessive requirements or stuff that we think that are not necessarily um, adding value to our product and, and making it like bigger, bigger and bigger. I called it like feature gluttony. Uh, but all here we'll be talking about, okay, how we can communicate effectively with our business partners, with our technical partners, just to make good decisions connected with the features that we would like to add to our product. Um, I add the Twitter handle, so feel free, feel free to tweet if you find something interesting. A uh, few words about me. I have Agile background. I'm part of the Agile Lean um, Europe community. Um, frequently, I'm speaking at Agile conferences. Today, I have pleasure to speak to you. I hope that you'll like it. Um, from the, my career perspective, I work in Agile teams like for uh, four years right now. My total career history is like seven years. Um, but usually I'm working as a business analyst and acting as a product owner in Scrum teams or basically Agile teams. So I'm responsible for the requirements and basically I'm product person. Okay, so maybe we can start from the question why we should actually care. If our customers want more and more features, it basically means that we have work. Our development teams have work, um, IT department have work, so probably we should be happy. But it's not necessarily the case. We'll see the examples. Um, usually, if we want more and more features, it's connected, for example, with that, that the business process inside the company is like ill. It's a bit like this overweighted kitten. Yeah? It's not overweighted because it's likes, it's because there's some external um, stuff that happened to it. It could be like ill, as I said, as a company. So. Uh, that's why the business users cannot achieve their goals with the existing software, so they want more features. And this is not necessarily cost to achieve the goal, and it's making only the process more and more complicated. It also be sometimes, you know, the, the various cases, you can say, okay, but this is the cartoon, we have a lot of examples from uh, just talking and complaining for other people, but just remember that all cartoons and all stories have some source in reality. And okay, so let's think about what can actually happen if we have like this huge legacy software and we want to add more and more features. Sometimes our legacy systems are, you know, big and we have a lot of change requests to them that are, you know, queuing and queuing, but our legacy system is working, basically. It's achieving the goal. It passed, in the case, this kitten was like passed the door and it was fine. But sometimes... Oh, sorry. Yes, sometimes our legacy system just broke down when we start adding the features. Uh, the performance is painfully slow. Maintenance of code is really, really painful because we simply don't know what happened when we add the change to the other parts of the system because it's so huge. Um, usually legacy systems don't have regression tests which are automated. So as well, this is like increasing the risk. 
Sometimes, and I have the experience in a corporate system, we have really similar functionalities that are, you know, really only slightly different from uh, each other. So instead of having the three functionalities that are doing more or less the same thing, maybe it would be better to have like one. So this talk will like hope, try to give you some kind of the hope if you work in such system or even if you work in a new shiny system that you, know, you also have to think about not replicating the functionality all over again, uh, only in a slightly different manner. So hopefully I light some hope for you and give some tangible stuff that allows you to talk with uh, stakeholders and business people and technology people just to avoid falling down as this kitten. Okay, so maybe we can start from first thinking, okay, how the gluttony, so the carving for more and more features influence our product, our backlog, and then we'll speak about the cure. Okay, so the first product, so the usability. Okay, if we have less features, it's usually easier to show them in a really nice way in a terms that it's user friendly, simple, but sometimes, or usually it's the case, we have really complex business functionality beneath, so it's not necessarily really easy to show it like this way here with the Apple products or Google products. So it's always like the parity and checking, okay, how, what we need to add and what could be like, for example, hidden, what could be simplified. And also by simplifying, I'm not meaning that, okay, we have complex business uh, reality and we are saying, okay, we are in IT and we are not doing it. No, no, it's rather than thinking together how to maintain the proper ratio, complexity and step. And as if you have like too many features, it's like with having too many road signs, you basically don't know what to follow. And it's really worth to remember that each time we're adding a new feature to existing system, the complexity grows. In the beginning, oh, the curve is quite flat, but then it's really, really hard to add anything. Um, I hope that you um, notice that in the systems yourself. But okay, this is also like interesting. Always in each system, we have the point where we have like the happy user. So this basically means that the user can accomplish his aim with the existing features. It doesn't mean that the user don't want more, because there are users and they are usually want more and more. It basically means that if we start adding the features, uh, the user will start to have problems with using the tools, so they will need manuals, they will uh, having the problem with finding the, you know, the stuff that they were working on, they will need more and more training. And this is the usually the case of the huge corporate systems because we want as many features as possible. We have different companies and different needs um, because again, this is the usually the case when we are a software vendor and need to deliver the usability for uh, the features for several other companies that are buying software and obviously they have slightly different needs. So the easiest way is to just add more and more similar features. Okay, how it influence our backlog? I think that it's especially important uh, when we are talking about Agile and Agile conferences and basically in Agile community. Because for example, roadmap, roadmap itself, it's really cool stuff to have, but sometimes we are having the trap of roadmap commitment and we are actually stop being agile. Uh, what does it mean? So especially if we have the software that is a piece of the bigger system. So we, our functionalities are dependent on other functionalities or other systems are dependent on us. So then we would like to know the dates. When we want to know the dates, again, we are just committing to certain stuff that to be done. Usually, if we have commitments, somewhere there are arriving like epics or user stories, estimations, stuff like that. And what does it cost? We don't have time for amending existing feature. Just imagine we are releasing new brand shiny functionality and instead of checking if it's working, instead of validating our um, assumption about the functionality, we just start working on the next one. So we don't have time and don't have even possibility 
to amend the feature in that way that instead of the, after a few months building another one, we are having like one which is really, really good. So that's why roadmap commits, commitment, especially if there are dates, are pretty, pretty tricky. We'll talk about how to have a nice, uh, sorry, nice roadmap uh, in a minute as well. So I mentioned this backlog. Backlog itself could be too big. Frequently we are talking about, okay, too big user stories, too small user stories, and we are really focusing of, about the backlog items itself. But sometimes the size of the backlog is a problem. Um, I frequently meet in the companies that the backlog was ready for two years ahead and everyone claimed that they were working in Agile. And I was asking, really? Backlog with commit committed dates ready for two years ahead and we have Agile? Okay, nice definition then. Um, my personal recommendation is just try to avoid if the company really is afraid that we forgot about doing something and they really believe that this is good, just create separate buckets like this will never be done or basically to think about later. Because honestly, when we have backlog ready two years ahead, and God forbid if we have the user story detailed with acceptance criteria, basically we will never do it. Why? Because reality changes. Um, because after developing the new features that were in the queue, our software simply changed. So the requirements governed two years ago simply don't match our software, which is have currently. So basically I recommend to have rather small backlog. Uh, with the few sprints ahead, if you must. Um, because again, planning is nothing bad, but excessive planning stop us from doing. And moreover, if you have such huge backlog, you don't need like one product owner. You need at least two or three or even five, because this is like hundreds of user stories to manage. It's a really huge number. So huge number for validation, for talking with stakeholders and so on. Okay, you may ask, okay, but business is afraid of um, deleting such stuff, so how we can keep it? Again, I will answer for that in the second part, but there is a way to have like nice high-level ideas instead of such detailed requirements. Okay, the next problem is priorities. Again, if we have such huge backlog, Priorities are not clear. Even if we have like um, ordered the backlog from the most important stuff at the top to the least important at the bottom, uh, then during the development, when we have to switch something because I don't know, we have some kind of the blocker, so we want to go to the next story. It's not necessarily obvious because here we have a lot of dependencies. We are not able to track because there is too many user stores. If we have 20 user stories or 10 user stories, then it's really easy to maintain and see where are dependencies. So, okay, so those were the problems. So quickly uh, to recap, the first stuff that is connected with um, our backlog and the problems with our backlog is basically usability, complexity of our products that simply grows when we add the features and the problems with not finding the feature anymore, having to use manual excessive training, stuff like that. Another part of the problem is basically backlog management and the stuff that are you know, heavily connected with uh, product management. Okay, so this was the first part. We know all, we know the all possible uh, problems. Probably there are a few more, so maybe they are not all, but they are the major one. So, okay. Estimates. This is the first thing that we are thinking when we have the user stories or any other backlog items, however we call them. And we are thinking, okay, maybe we can use estimates. And this creature here is uh, supposed to be a dragon. <laughs> Just my poor drawing. Um, okay. So maybe story points. Story points is the magic stuff that nobody in the industry understands especially our business partners, but they are clever and they are not that if, they are if the story points are big, then it's like something wrong happening. 
So at least now, at least this is like at this <laughs> at this point we are a bit aligned that the big story points are not good. So okay. So sometimes we are tempted to give the high estimate just to get rid of the some stories and disculpt them. It's not necessarily the good idea. And you may ask why. If we know that the business is usually scared or at least know that if there are, you know, big estimates that something wrong happening. Okay, so basically if the business don't understand the story points, they can easily um, you know, just say, okay, there are the num there are just numbers. If you are just constantly giving them big numbers, they can start to be used to them. And especially that please remember there are other human beings, they are intelligent as well, and they are starting to think, oh, come on, maybe they are using those numbers just to, you know, make us think that this is like, I don't know, too big, too complex, too something, and they are simply lazy. So there are, you know, many excuses that can be um, give her, given here. Um, what else? They had the magic excels, especially project managers. Even though we try to say like, come on, story points are not man hours. They are not Mondays. They are not connected with, you know, in a really easy way with the time. This is the complexity there. There is really, this is a really complex measure. Okay, okay, okay. And then putting to Excel the numbers and having, okay, it takes two weeks. Excellent. We have estimation. We have deadline. We have commitment for delivering the feature for within two weeks. Excellent. And we are about, and we are forgetting about that, that estimate is like a bit about guessing. We are not saying this is the definite deadline. This is more or less the day that you can assume that we will be progressing towards the end or we'll hopefully finish, but it's not, you know, definite. And I think the biggest uh, issue here that they don't understand that we are estimating it so highly because it's not actually beneficial for business people, business uh, users, especially if we estimate the feature only because we think that it's like, I don't know, excessive or not suited to the current implementation of the software. So for example, um, my teams, when I just arrived, um, had some kind of the hmm, tradition of giving the high estimate if they see that, for example, the new feature will destroy the performance. So instead of communicating that, that, sorry, adding this, you are basically risking that the whole application will slow down dramatically, they were giving the high estimates. So this is not the way. Okay. So let's try to clean up this stuff. And the question is, okay, how to start? The best way is start from the cleaning up the vision and the commitments. Um, pretty tricky, especially if we have the roadmap uh, already committed. Pretty tricky if we are the software vendor and we have marketing team uh, who is going to the customers and telling, oh, you'll get this feature I don't know, after a year, after a half a year, yeah? So this is not only the change in IT, but also requires the cooperation with other departments. Depending how silo we, our company is, it's easier or not so easy. Um, but the nice way that we can have the all ideas for the development of our, our product, our platform, is product tree. It's basically quite easy concept. Uh, we have the branches which represents modules or categories and the leaves that are features. All the stuff which are within this blue line here are the current time box. So if we are working in sprints, this could be like the sprint. If we want to work in like bigger chunks like, I don't know, releases, this could be the release. If you are working in Kanban, this can be like, okay, those are the things that we simply tackle first and we will see how long it takes. All those ideas here are basically stuff we would like to do in the future. So the next question is, okay, what are those leaves? There are high level ideas. We are gathering people into the room and saying, okay, just think about the new features that we would like to build in the software. If the software is already existing, of course there are new, if we are building something from scratch, 
this probably will be your first base, first stuff that have to work. So then we will also talk a bit about how to actually check if it's working. Um, here, if we have small post-it notes, I usually draw it on the paper and have post-it post post notes. Um, it's really hard to write really a lot of requirements on one post-it, so that's why we keep it simple. And really huge advantage of having only the ideas on post-it that they are not user stories, they are not estimated, they are really high level, and this could be an idea. Let's say that we are working for bank and we are producing the application for logging. Right now, quite uh, popular is logging uh, via fingerprint, especially for uh, like iPhone devices. So let's say if we were in some few years ago and saying, okay, we have the idea of using the uh, native functionality of the phones to log in, it's really high level and then when the new technology arrives, like fingerprinting, we can adjust. Oh, okay, now we have time to take the, a look on the using easy ways of um, logging to the bank site and now we have the new technology which didn't actually exist like two years or three years ago. So we can use it uh, in a nice way. Okay, but let's start from those ideas here because there are high level ideas and we need some scope. Uh, before we just detailed those stories, or those I items, sorry, it would be good to actually evaluate them. On this axis, oh, it's a bit cut, but this is the uh, money, money side. Uh, so this is basically ROI or any stuff connected with money. And here is, for example, usability and other stuff that can be, been, you know, um, really important for you, for your users, for your company depending on what you want to actually improve. So this here, the context is a king, so worth to check with, again, with the company and with the needs. So again, maybe some kind of the example. Let's say that we have the broadcasting TV company and they will have the software for um, ads. Uh, so for putting ads in there. So for them, it's really important that we have ads in correct order with the correct time block. So if we add the functionality that actually destroy that, for example, instead of correct order, we have random order. Basically, we are not improving anything. So this point on, for this point on the axis will be somewhere here. So we take all those leaves and thinking, okay, how how they are influencing our potential earnings and our current software. So for example, current usability or stuff like that. Uh, we are evaluating it, putting to it, and basically in the end we have a picture like that. It's really beneficial if we are to taking it, doing it with the whole team, with the whole stakeholders, because we are talking. And the team knows, okay, why the particular function or the particular idea is so highly here and why something is really on the bottom here. Obviously, the things that we would like to do first are those. Not necessarily it's the MVP yet, because those are, again, only ideas. We think that they will bring us money and they, for example, improve the usability. But uh, it's not always the case, so it's worth to have some metrics to check, okay, how we are doing, um, I'm not a fan of having really uh, detailed metrics, rather using stuff like here, so the sad and uh, smiling face, I recommend to have like three, maximum five metrics, and better to have like odd number than even, because if we have like, let's say two or four metrics, and we measure our story against, um, against those, and we have like two here, two here, it's quite hard to decide. So let's say that we are the airline and we want to have the functionality connected with searching the tickets online. Now it's everywhere. And we have the booking engine beneath it and we need to come expose it, probably by some API, to the web browser. And now we have the idea of this feature uh, and the several other features from the tree. And we are taking this one and thinking, okay, this is beneficial because when we allow our customers to look on the website on our prices, they don't have to go to the uh, travel agencies, so basically it's like direct sale, so it's beneficial for us. 
Uh, but maybe it's uh, influencing not really well on the perf. Oh, sorry, not really well on the performance. So we are saying, okay, so we need to protect our infrastructure because now suddenly thousands of customers will ask for the prices, and our booking engine may not survive it. So this is the one part. On the other hand, this is like really beneficial because we increase our sales. So this is another point of the process, and we say, okay. It could be good. We have the problem with the performance, so maybe we need to add additional story or additional item <coughs> to take care of this, just to not slow down the system and basically kill it. Again, the estimates should be rough. Why? Um, because at this point, it's quite hard to have exact numbers. I'm not saying that it's not good to not trying to do so, but usually it takes time. And when we have high level ideas, the first round should be okay, identify those that are the most valuable, start doing them, and then maybe tackle those that are uh, less valuable or the metrics that we have are suggesting that we are breaking the business process. Because again, uh, all software have the crucial business stuff that they have to do. And again, example from life, I don't know if you're using the Microsoft link, I think it's not existing anymore because it was replaced by uh, Skype, but when the product was in, Microsoft introduced the new feature that basically synchronized the, and exposed the calendar in Microsoft link. Excellent idea. However, it caused that in the Outlook when you were adding the new meeting, the synchronization take hours, like, you know, like one second. So like in the you know, in current environment, one second is like ages uh, for people and they are impatient. So the functionality that was nice to have for Link actually destroyed the functional, the really excellent functionality in Outlook and people start to be annoyed. So that's why it's worth to check if our key core business process is not interrupted by additional features that we are adding because this can annoy our users. Okay, and sometimes we are in the position that we have to have some kind of the estimate because we are in such kind of the company that we cannot just use the smiles or you know the trees and uh, some kind of the axis because people will just look at us really weirdly and say, okay, I need the numbers to put to my Excel spreadsheet. Uh, so then again, try not only use the story points but also add for example, business value is quite commonly used as well, and risk. Um, they are easy to understand. Each project manager understands uh, risk. With the business value, it's quite tricky because people tend to transfer it to directly to money, and this should be like kind of the model which shows us on the scale, okay, how valuable it is. It's not necessarily one-to-one -one, uh, return of the investments, but again, it's usually quite uh, easy to understand. If you can, add your own measures. So for example, if it's really crucial for you to have good performance because you are the booking engine, so other competitors, again, want to be as quick as possible, or you are really, um, your security is there, like a crucial part because you are the bank and nobody wants to have you know, their money stolen. So add some additional, um, metrics that can help you to estimate stuff and make the some kind of the scale there just to also not have like direct uh, connection with uh, money which are quite hard to again to estimate and it will take time okay so moving forward when we have only story points and this is like ridiculous number but let's assume that this story is ridiculous itself and we would like to like scare our customer it's not saying anything except that it's like big number. It's maybe even a nice number, 21, why not? If we add the stuff, so additional, uh, additional estimates and deliver it to our partners, we can ha actually start discussing because we see, okay, risk. It's risky because it can break system. Business value is usually, should be usually estimated by um, our business uh, partners, but when we have, I don't know if you remember uh, this graph with axis with the ROI and some kind of the love, we can also ourselves assume that if something was really highly 
uh, there, then it had the bigger uh, business value. So that's why it's also helpful because give us the insight what is valuable by business and we can do it like ourselves and then only validate. So it simplify a lot because we understand what we are building. So basically this allows our discussions and we can also propose some kind of alternatives and see, okay, maybe we can do something slightly different. So going again to the example with logging to the bank system. So let's say that we think, okay, we want to have the fingerprint um, login in every possible device. And this is, let's say, story A, assuming that the technology is completely new. Um, and this is, okay, it's risky, but maybe if we just focus on iPhones that are relatively, again, that it's new, but it's like working for the other vendors as well. So maybe, you know, it's also like difficult to do, but the risk is smaller because we are focusing only on one platform. Also, if we have the statistics that let's say 90% of our customers are having iPhones, then we are like, make, can expose it to the business value as well and say, okay, so let's try to deal with majority of our customers first and then when we will achieve it in a good way, then we can think about the rest. Because again, there will be a lot of security issues around that and stuff like that. Um, we can also have a discussion around stories like that. So we see that the story is quite big, quite risky and have really low business value. And this could be the decision, okay, we are not doing it at all. Uh, if it's the continuation of the previous history, so the login for the last of the devices, let's say, probably no one do it, but let's say login to uh, through your own personal computer by fingerprint uh, to the bank, because sometimes we are logging to the si operational system like that, but I actually didn't see that ever anyone uh, login in such way to the bank, but maybe it could be the functionality. Uh, that could be the scope, simply, because if it's big, if it's not uh, giving the business value and we have nice exposure, even for business, it's easier to make decision. okay, maybe we don't need it. If we have only story points, the visibility is not really clear. So this allows to make decision. What else? If we have alternatives, it's really good to compare them, what is inside. Um, of course, the best case scenario, we have everything. But sometimes uh, by doing the alternative, we are getting rid of some crucial functionality and, something, and sometimes getting rid of the functionality that actually it's not so important and we can sacrifice it. Um, of course, depend on the stuff that we are doing. Uh, if we present it like that, again, our business partners or basically people who are working with us in the project are also more calm that we actually rethink what we are doing and we know um, basically uh, the constraints and other stuff connected with the stuff we are doing. And again, here, if we have performance, we can give the indicators, we can give the numbers. And here is actually the place if we can measure something and expose, okay, so this, feature, this story potentially increase uh, our performance, but this one, in done in an original way that we requested, actually decrease the performance. And we know the more or less per percentages or the amount, then it's easier to discuss because we have something to discuss on. Again, if we have only story points or only like rough discussion that we shouldn't do it because no, then we won't progress. If we are starting to present more and more um, ideas to do it maybe slightly differently if we present the metrics and we are, and we are communicating that the stuff we want to discope is actually not good for the software or like a whole, then we can discuss why it's important, especially if we have the silos in the companies because a lot of companies want to do it agile and they are focusing on doing agile on IT, but they have other silos which are not agile at all. Uh, so if we are trying to communicate with them and convincing that the stuff that we are doing are good, so the agile methodology or thinking about the features like in that way, basically help us to communicate and show, okay, this is the alternative, we can do it slightly different and everyone be happy. 
really remember to add recommendations because this is also like stuff that myself did sometimes. So produce really nice kind of reports or kind of mail because sometimes you cannot uh, communicate directly and you have to send emails or reports. This is the reality. And forgot about adding recommendations. So I put all those alternatives, all those tasks and thought, okay, they will figure it out themselves. But what they did, they scroll down and check if there are recommendations. They then scroll up, take a look on graphs and then said, okay, we can do, you know, just carry on as we initially agreed. I don't have time to analyze. Uh, so it's really good to have a numbers because it's like proves your point, but it's really good to have the recommendations in downstairs, uh, in the bottom of the page or bottom of the email, because it helps the people who are busy to make decisions or at least think, okay, so your recommendation is different than the initial plan, so let's take a look on numbers you presented. Usually it works that way. If you just skip this point, then you risk that it will just flow uh, with the other stuff and will be like missed. Okay, so just to quickly wrap up what we are talking about here. Problem with the complexity is of course connected with UX, code maintenance, a usability for our users. Also, we in an industry we have problem with two big backlogs with stop us from being truly agile, with the roadmaps commitments, which are tricky as well, especially when we are uh, in the end late, and causes that we don't have time to measure and learn and adapt to the stuff that we learned. So those are the tricky parts, and how to tackle it, how to make this slightly different, uh, keep the requirements as a project trees. Uh, basically, this is the stuff taken from book which is called Innovation Games, I really recommend it because there's a, a lot of ideas that you can use on a daily basis that can help you to have a bit of fun and make the project, you know, again, more light, I would say, not so heavily with, you know, Jira backlogs or version 1 backlogs or Excel backlogs, so this is um, really good. Again, try to figure it out what is the true value you would like to achieve with the application. Validate it, because uh, as I said, sometimes the really good ideas can destroy your application because we are killing the performance. And again, also really important stuff to remember. This maybe are cool ideas, but sometimes we need something from here and here and here just to make up working. Uh, because again, we need some boring stuff as well. So just focusing here, it's important, especially if we are trying to figure out if we are doing feature or not. If you are building application from scratch, it's worth to take a look and take the, the bigger picture in a consideration just to make certain that basically uh, our application makes sense. Um, if we are estimating as the stuff that are tangible as well for the business people and the stuff that they are understanding. So the risk, business value, or add any other metrics it's, which is important for your business. Remember that the context is really important. So for each company, it will be slightly different. If you're a smaller company, probably it would be easier than if you are a big software vendor. And in the end, remember, less is more if we have application that it's not having features but do the job so basically our users can achieve business goal they will be really happy and i think that it's really visible in currently in industry that huge corporate systems are replaced by the systems that are done by the start startups so there are basically not a lot of features but allowed to do the job and this is really important and i hope that this is the lesson that we can learn and do you have any questions? Because I think I will have a few minutes. I've got one about risk. So yeah. You talked about the risk of doing things. Yeah. Um, you can look at risk in two ways. I guess it's the risk of are you going to be able to deliver? Yeah. And then it's the risk of that thing actually realizing the value you didn't think it's going to. So was it, is risk encapsulating both of those things, or do you focus more on one than the other? So in my particular example, and yeah, should I, I should state it more clearly, 
uh, it was rather this negative side of the risk. So basically that um, you can fail by delivering it, not the opportunity, but yeah, true. Thank you for remark. Any other questions? Yeah? This one. Uh, so you work with the business people together. You are having them in a room, depending what kind of company you are. Just assume that okay, if you are internal IT department, you are taking your sponsors and key users to the room. If you are working as a software vendor, and you have marketing people, sales people, uh, maybe some kind of the team from research and development. So those are the key stakeholders. Maybe if you are able to have like at least one key user from the custom your customers in the room, it would be brilliant as well. Because also I learned that the stuff that users want and the picture that we get from all those other departments are sometimes different. Um, so it's really good to have the actually it's like the really crucial to have those people in the room and we are discussing. And when you are discussing, you are saying, okay. Maybe this, let's say, this login feature, it should be here because, you know, it's only login. People can type in their login. Why we, don't, why we need fingerprint, yeah? Uh, but then someone says, no, it's so innovative. Our customers who have iPhones just used to just click the, uh, you know, fingerprint and don't type the numbers. So it's like really old fashioned and, you know, soon we'll be out of the competition. So it's not only good for the users, but will bring us, just help us to maintain the current user base, stuff like that. So this is the discussion. And because you have people in the room that previously provide those ideas, then can justify. And then if the development team is together with them, they starting to understand why the features or why the certain uh, ideas are higher and why they are sometimes lower, because when we're discussing, basically, we are giving our arguments. And also, it's really important here that we, as a IT, we can fit as well and say, come on, but this feature will, I don't know, kill the app, slow down, or maybe say, okay, we can do it really more innovative way, like, I don't know, um, thought transfer, maybe it will be possible soon. Uh, so we can give the, some kind of the solutions we shouldn't at this stage, but we can um, just to fit to the discussion as well and make something slightly different as well. And I think it's also good at this stage that because there are not firm requirements with acceptance criteria or they are not really strict, you can still amend and work on them. So, yeah. Okay. So thank you for your attention. Uh, have a lovely day. And yeah. Thank you.